Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest who lived about 600 years before Jesus. He was around 25 years old when he was forcibly taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. He was married. We don't know if they had any children. He began receiving visions from the Lord at around age 30. And in the book, by his name, he employs a apocalyptic imagery, parable, prophecy, and street theater. He recalls how the Lord told him his wife would abruptly die. And he was told by the Lord not to mourn. This woman had been the delight of his eyes, and he would have loved to honor her with burial rites, but the Lord even saw fit to use that hardship to preach to his own people that their love for him had died without mourning. So when this guy does lament, as he does in our passage, we need to pay attention to what he does lament. And Ezekiel saw in a vision the presence of the Lord leaving the temple in Jerusalem and the Lord revealing himself to Ezekiel in exile in Babylon. Ezekiel explains the idolatry of Israel, Judah, that led up to the exodus, uh, the exile, uh, and he prophesies against Israel and then against Israel's enemies, Ammon, Moab, Seir, Edom, Philistia, before focusing on two power players, Tyre, and Egypt. So let's now turn to God's word to read Ezekiel 26, 17 through 27, 36. And they will raise a lamentation over you and say to you, how you, Tyre, have perished, you who were inhabited from the seas, O city renowned, who was mighty on the sea. She and her inhabitants imposed their terror on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall, and the coastlands that are on the sea are dismayed at your passing. For thus says the Lord God, When I make you a city laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you and the great waters cover you, then I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old, and I will make you to dwell in the world below among ruins from of old with those who go down to the pit, so that you will not be inhabited. But I will set beauty in the land of the living, I will bring you to a dreadful end, and you shall be no more. Though you be sought for, you will never be found again, declares the Lord God. The word of the Lord came to me. Now you, son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre, and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrances to the sea, merchant of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says the Lord God. O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the heart of the seas. Your builders made perfect your beauty. They made all your planks of fir trees from Sanir. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make a mast for you. Of oaks of Bashan they made your oars. They made your deck of pines from the coasts of Cyprus inlaid with ivory. Of fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail serving as your banner. Blue and purple from the coast of Elisha was your awning. The inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad were your rowers. Your skilled men, O Tyre, were in you. They were your pilots. The elders of Gabal and her skilled men were in you, caulking your seams. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in you to barter for your wares. And I'm going to skip over to uh, verse 25. The ships of Tarshish traveled for you with your merchandise, so you were filled and heavily laden in the heart of the seas. Verse 26. Your rowers have brought you out into the high seas. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas. Your riches, your wares, your merchandise, your mariners and your pilots, your caulkers, your dealers in merchandise, and all your men of war who are in you, with all your crew that is in your midst, sink into the heart of the seas on the day of your fall. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the countryside shakes. 
and down from their ships come all who handle the oar. The mariners and all the pilots of the sea stand on the land and shout aloud over you and cry out bitterly. They cast dust on their heads and wallow in ashes. They make themselves bald for you and put sackcloth on their waist. And they weep over you in bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. In their wailing, they raise a lamentation for you and lament over you. Who is like Tyre? Like one destroyed in the midst of the sea, when your wares came from the seas, you satisfied many peoples, and with your abundant wealth and merchandise, you enriched the kings of the earth. Now you are wrecked by the seas, in the depths of the waters, your merchandise and all your crew in your midst have sunk with you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you, and the hair of their kings bristles with horror, their faces are convulsed. The merchants among the peoples hiss at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Tyre was a Phoenician city that founded Carthage as a trading outpost. And after about 100 years of dependence on Tyre, Carthage became independent around 650 B.C., which is about 60 years before the beginning of Ezekiel's ministry. So Tyre was an influential Mediterranean power. And Canaanites, who had settled in Lebanon close to the sea due to the mountain ranges, moved up to found Tyre thousands of years ago. And far from being unenlightened Philistines, These were cultured, artistic, diverse tradesmen who trammeled in the first things the Mediterranean could offer, the finest things the Mediterranean can offer. And there were many fine things. But they were Baal worshippers. And the most recognizable Baal worshipper in the Bible, Queen Jezebel, was a princess of Tyre before she was Ahab's wife. Tyre was a powerful, beautiful city with Grecian columns, wide docks, aquatic infrastructure. She had outposts on Cyprus and Spain, not to mention Carthage. She traded in cedar, ivory, dye, pottery. She was a metropolis for literally thousands of years before Ezekiel's time. The myths of Europa, where we get the word Europe, Dido and Pygmalion all have their origin in Tyre. Is Europe a place of high culture and art? She gets her name from a Tyrian princess. What about the Greeks? Were they celebrated as early cultured philosophers? They got their alphabet from Tyre. So, they were the original venture capitalists, yacht club, lettered colonizers. And Ezekiel is singing about their downfall. Their downfall was epic. The prophecy preceding this lament speaks of a slaughter, making Tyre an uninhabited, bare rock. And now there's a city of Tyre today with a population of my hometown, Bowie, Maryland. But it isn't built on the original site, which is uninhabited ruins. And if you go online and look up Tyre, one of the first pictures you'll get is a sea view looking at the city, and you can see just beneath the surface of the water, Greek columns, ruins in the sea. Historians call it Tyre, ruins built with ruins. Our reading selection today begins with a lamentation raised by the princes of the sea. They're troubled. They're trembling. Tyre's songs and music have stopped. And the princes literally disrobe and sit down shaking to lament. You can imagine what they might have been feeling. Their esteemed, powerful, protected business partner just got taken down. They're shivering because they wonder if they are next. If Tyre can fall, we can fall. Tyre was terrifying, and now they're toppled and were terrified. Tyre had set themselves against the Lord and his people, and now they lay in ruins. Who would be next? 
Egypt, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, France, Germany, England, Japan, Russia, the United States of America. The Lord judges his mightiest opponents. And a nation reveals itself to be the Lord's opponent as it sets itself against God's people. If the mightiest, most long-lasting opponents can't stand against God's wrath, every opponent should fear. And we? What are we called to do as God's people? Are we called to tear them, tear those regimes down? Are we called to buttress up tottering regimes? No, we're called to lament, to sing, to remember the fallen opponents. Why? Several reasons. Number one, we usually only think of these earthly powers as permanent, given, essential, unmovable, established. So singing their demise reminds us that all earthly power is passing. Two, lamenting the fall of superpowers also convicts us of our own sin, of our own fragile sustenance before the Lord. For the faithful to sing of the fall of a foe, we are simultaneously struck to the heart by the realization that there but for the grace of God go I. If it weren't for God's grace in my life, I too could be justifiably punished, demolished, devastated. The bigger they come, the harder they fall. The bigger they come, the more we're afraid of them. Tyre was renowned, mighty, terrifying. The temptation would have been to do whatever Tyre tells you to do. The temptation would have been to mimic whatever you could about Tyre. But for all Tyre's vaunted glory and influence, it only meant that her fall would cover that much more distance. The original recipients of Ezekiel's prophecy would have been encouraged that epic opponents could and would fall to the Lord's sovereign plan. Such truth would help them weather the 70 years storm of exile in Babylon. For you, when you witness opponents of God's people threatening God's flock, tempting our young away with fairy tales of pagan power and pleasure, know their end. They will fail. They will fall. The only question is, how far? The higher they lift themselves, the more fiery will be their fall. The gospel of Jesus is a trajectory in the exact opposite direction, though. Jesus, enthroned in heaven, stepped down from his throne, removed his robe of glory, and clothed himself with flesh trembling in his mother's arms to redeem you. And he has risen, and he has ascended. And how great is his rise, how glorious, how beautiful. Only let us lay hold of his fringe, that we may rise with him. Beautiful roads never go far. It's an old Indo-Chinese proverb, which means our long journey of life is often ugly, plain, scary, and functionally, for a long road, you want the cheapest material that will work, not the loveliest. There's a lovely little cobblestone road in Annapolis. Doesn't go far. Beyond a couple streets. Ornate, intricate, high-end, is cost prohibitive to mass produce, and sometimes prone to decay. Tyre was beautiful, gorgeous, these beautiful vistas of the sea and mountains, aromas of grilled fish. It was multicultural in its makeup, dealing in and crafting in imported wood, the smell of which, as when I went down to McElwain to see Harvey Clay, smells like money, they say. It was imported cypress wood with ivory inlays. Talk about boutique, talk about bourgeois. And that was for the deck. Egyptian linen. It, it's like what we look for in the finest sheets for our bed. 
uh, sturdy and fine, but that was for their sale. Expensive, surely. And Tyre's uh, human resources were multi-ethnic and enviable. We, we skipped that part. A, a beautiful, colorful palette whom all the Mediterranean wanted to trade in. That, this sounds wonderful. Why not desire this? Why can't this last? This sounds like a multi-ethnic capitalist dream utopia. What are we missing? Why doesn't the Lord providentially bless this city? Because, like the Babel of old, like the Babylon of Revelation, she boasts in her own beauty and not in the Lord, who she never mentions. Beauty apart from the Lord never goes far. In the example of Tyre, it went for thousands of years, which is farther than most, farther than you could hope, but far better to hope in our beautiful Lord who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, whose mind made all that is beautiful before we merely stumbled on it, copied it, held it in our hands for a moment. Great, beautiful, grand works of architecture, engineering, fine art can all be co-opted into the idolatry of culture who has canceled the Creator. How much respect and honor do we pay to great cultural institutions like Harvard, Yale, Smithsonian, Audubon, Hopkins? Yet how foolish would those institutions be if they denied their own origin story? How little should we pay attention to beautiful messaging when it is set against God? Instead of being swayed by beautiful influencers, honor the Lord. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. A person who fears the Lord is to be praised. Kick a man while he's down. This seems to be the strategy employed here when Tyre falls, former allies, trading partners, residents, clientele, instead of coming to the rescue, instead of kind compassion, what do they do? They hiss at Tyre once she's fallen. This seems to recite a sad reality that we see reiterated a hundred times politically. Once a superpower is shaken, surrounding powers pounce, and they fill the power vacuum with their own designs. And perhaps you've even seen this process at work in your own family. When one child is being disciplined, the other children gather around to say, yeah, and he did that to me. And he didn't ever let me have my thing back. Yeah, and the pylon continues. In Ezekiel's time, this is what happened to Tyre, tragically. Her neighbors never allowed her to recover. Shouting over her, wallowing, wailing, and sackclothing for Tyre wasn't in commiseration. It was more a song of release, like the munchkins. In the Wizard of Oz, ding dong, the witch is dead, the wicked old witch is dead. So is the application for us to kick a man when he's down? No. Men, parties, states, empires will be kicked when they're down without our help. Our role, our call is to sing. Sing that powers great all fall without the Lord. Remember that history and bring it to mind and sing it in the Lord's presence. Zero sum gain. When Tyre was thriving in trade, it wasn't at the expense of others. They were all thriving together all trading partners. And when Tyre falls, the surrounding nations don't all necessarily get more of the trade pie in Tyre's fall. They're all impoverished, and so they all weep and lament. How should we view great powers falling in the past century? Was it not to our gain that Germany, Russia, Japan fell in power that America might gain? Well, that would be a zero-sum game. 
their losses would be gains for the rest of the world powers. But all this geopolitical power gathering matters little to us in the final accounting. What does it matter if our leader wears a red tie or a blue, speaks Chinese or Russian, extends the border by a mile or retracts it by two? What matters in the final accounting for cities, men, states, empires, is whether they bow the knee to the king of kings and lord of lords. If a person bows the knee to Christ, he doesn't take blessing from others. Rather, he blesses those around him. If a city acknowledges the Lord God, she will establish her foundations in the heavens. And though the earth be shaken, she shall not be moved. If a nation acknowledges the Lord and gives him thanks and glory, In all that they do, esteeming his laws, eschewing idols, that there will be no limit to the longevity and blessing that they will experience. But if a nation sets herself against the Lord and his people, she will fall. And we, God's people, will be here to sing at her downfall. Not that we take any delight or gain any plunder, but we will sing. Because we know that the Lord executes righteousness in all the earth. And that truth turns any lament into a lay of merriment. Let's pray. Nations rise, nations fall. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord, we are tempted to be swayed by the powerful. We are tempted to be discouraged by them. We are tempted to think that they are permanent. But no power that sets itself against you has any permanence and will fall just as Tyre did. Whether they reign for hundreds of years or thousands, you reign over all. And we come before you this day to sing to you, to rejoice in you, and to remember that anyone, any power that sets itself against you will fall. And that gives us hope and encouragement. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.